Land may be a good place to grow corn, and a home may be the place you rest your bones. But real estate is also an opportunity for speculation. It is the democratic asset. The majority of American households own their own homes, and many of them hope for a bit of price appreciation. Real estate speculation runs through the history of America like a vein of fool's gold. British settlement of North America really began in 1606 with the Virginia companies of Plymouth and London. These were joint stock companies that were meant to make money by settling the eastern coast of North America. The London company sought profits by establishing the Jamestown colony and later granted a land patent to some pilgrims who were interested in settling in the north. Colonial era land acquisition differed from more modern real estate speculation. The shortest path to vast acreage was to receive it as a bequest from the king. King Charles II granted William Penn an amazing 45,000 square miles in exchange for cancelling a debt of merely 16,000 pounds. In a sense, Penn sat on the cusp of the watershed between feudal and capitalist approaches to land. Medieval monarchs had long rewarded their followers with generous land grants, and in return those followers were meant to govern the land in the monarch's absence. Penn was almost a substitute monarch within Pennsylvania. By contrast, capitalist ownership of land may confer rights of use and sale, but not the ability or obligation to enforce the law. This distinction became particularly relevant in the debate over Western New York State. Royal charters had granted Massachusetts the rights to land from sea to sea. Royal gift had also granted the Duke of York, later James II, and his province of New York the rights to all of the erstwhile Dutch province, which included upstate New York. The two states eventually worked out their disagreement in the 1786 Treaty of Hartford. The land would be legally incorporated into New York State, but it would be owned, in the capitalist sense, by Massachusetts. Massachusetts promptly sold the six million acres, or more properly, the rights to negotiate with the natives of the land, to two businessmen, Oliver Phelps and Nathaniel Gorham, for one million pounds. Phelps and Gorham couldn't make their payments, so the land was then sold to the legendary Robert Morris, perhaps America's greatest land speculator. Morris had thrived as a Philadelphia merchant. He helped finance the American Revolution and served as America's superintendent of finance from 1781 to 1784. Morris had the global reach to buy land from Seneca Indians and resell it to investors in London and Amsterdam. Morris, like many real estate speculators, eventually overreached, accumulating vast debts in order to pay for his land empire, and he ended up in debtor's prison. His bust was associated with an early financial crisis. As is so often the case in U.S. real estate history, if Morris could have only held on for a few more years, his land would have turned a healthy profit. Many of America's founding fathers gambled on land. George Washington was a large-scale land accumulator. He and Benjamin Franklin both speculated in frontier territory in Ohio. America had so much land and so much promise that buying acreage must have seemed like the most obvious thing in the world. Moreover, when the Founding Fathers invested in land, they gained a very personal incentive to try to build the infrastructure that would make Western lands accessible to the markets of the East. These large tracts were agricultural, and America would continue to see speculative farm purchases for another two centuries. Alabama saw a great explosion and crash in cotton land prices in 1819. Iowa and Illinois saw wheat land prices boom during the first decades of the 20th century and then crash during the early 1920s. In both cases, the buyers during the boom seemed perfectly rational. Land prices were reasonable given the high prices of cotton and wheat. But the buyers made the classic investor's mistake. They failed to anticipate the power of supply to determine prices in the long run. Cotton prices were high during the Napoleonic Wars, and wheat was expensive during World War I. But it is easy to grow both cotton and wheat in much of the world. And consequently, prices just can't stay that high. When peace prevailed, farm prices and then land prices plummeted because of the fairly elastic global supply of both cotton and wheat. Starting in the 1830s, we begin to see urban land booms as well. When the state of Illinois announced the plan for the Illinois and Michigan Canal, the Chicago real estate market exploded. The canal would make Chicago the linchpin of a, of a great watery arc that would span all the way from New York to New Orleans. Surely that would make the city an urban colossus with land prices to match. A speculative frenzy ensued. Harriet Martineau's contemporary description is classic. 
And I quote, It seemed as if some prevalent mania infected the whole people. As the gentlemen of our party walked the streets, storekeepers hailed them from their doors with offers of farms and all manners of land lots, advising them to speculate before the price of land rose higher. Chicago had busted by 1840, but again, if the buyers had only been able to hold on, they would have done quite well. That fact is a bit misleading, since Illinois saw scores of new cities in the 1830s, and most of them failed. As transportation stretched west, Los Angeles experienced its real estate boom during the 1880s. These early land bubbles were mostly gambling on undeveloped land. Urban real estate speculation took another leap when metal frame skyscrapers made it possible to build up on small plots of central land. Taller buildings have two opposing effects on land values. First, holding the price of urban interior space constant. Building up makes land more valuable because taller buildings mean more interior space on the same amount of land. Second, building up will deliver more urban space and consequently cause the price of that space to fall. During the decades before World War I, the first effect seemed to dominate. Buyers were excited about the ability to erect taller towers, and they seemed to ignore the depressing role that extra supply would eventually have on price. Land prices initially rose along with the skyscrapers. During the late 1920s, a race to the heavens broke out in Manhattan. The Woolworth Building, a 792-foot cathedral of commerce, had reigned over the New York City skyline from 1913. Then three separate groups decided to vie for the bragging rights of owning the world's tallest building. A downtown financial group built 40 Wall Street, which soared to 927 feet. In Midtown, Walter Chrysler and his architect William Van Allen put up an iconic Art Deco spire on the top of their building to bring it to over 1,000 feet. But both were surpassed by the gigantic Empire State Building, the spire of which was over 1,400 feet from the ground. Empire State was the brainchild of John J. Raskob of General Motors and Pierre S. DuPont. New York State's former governor and the former Democratic candidate for president, Al Smith, was their spokesman. These buildings were perhaps the products of the irrational exuberance that abounded during the Roaring Twenties, but they were completed during the darker days of the Great Depression. Once again, the builders don't seem to have anticipated what all that new supply would do to office rents. Empire State would be mocked for years as the empty state building because finding tenants during the Great Depression was so difficult. On the upside, the building cost far less than expected because of the depressed price of steel. Real estate gambling would continue throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. A great wave of buying and building from 2000 to 2007 would help create another Great Recession. Once again, the buyers in Las Vegas in 2005 seem to have forgotten that there are a few barriers to building in America's sand cities, and consequently, prices cannot stay above construction costs forever. With the wisdom of hindsight, it is easy to mock the speculators who lost so much on real estate over the centuries. But most of the time, reasonable beliefs could readily justify the prices being paid. Moreover, real estate speculation created the incentives that connected the American hinterland and that built some of the world's most spectacular skylines.